Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scripture Verse by Verse. My name is Michael Moret. We're in the book of Acts, continuing our verse by verse study. Through the book of Acts, we come today to Acts chapter 8, resuming our study in verse 10. So if you can, get your Bible, open it up to Acts chapter 8, and uh, we will begin right after I remind you that the Scripture Verse by Verse website is found at thebibleversebyverse.com and that you can study the entire Bible along with me using, your, or using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. So again, all you need to bring is your Bible. Everything else is set. Just bring your Bible, open it up, settle in, and study the Word of God with me from Genesis through Revelation at your pace, at your convenience. Again, at thebibleversebyverse.com. All right, we'll pick it up now in uh, Acts chapter 8, verse 10. Let's pray. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your Word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, let's... Uh, Let's go back to verse 5 and begin reading there. It says, Then Philip, Christian preacher, went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Now, the church in Jerusalem has scattered except for the apostles, and, and that's because a great persecution broke out in Jerusalem against the Christians. So Philip took off, and of course he's preaching the gospel wherever he goes, like everybody else. And he went to Samaria. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spoke, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Well, God was confirming the message of Jesus Christ to the Samaritans with signs and wonders. And that's exactly what he did in Jerusalem to the Jewish people. And it says in verse 9, now here comes trouble. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously, in the same city, used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some one, some great one. So we are introduced to a sorcerer, a man of the devil, who used magic and sorcery to try to make a name for himself, and he had quite a reputation in the Samaritan area. And notice verse 10, to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. The people in general were spellbound by Simon's apparent power to do supernatural works. When people do not understand the scriptures, they can easily be fooled into thinking that something is of God simply because it displays supernatural power. Everybody thought, this is the great man of God because he did miracles. Not necessarily. And in this case, absolutely not. But if you don't know the scriptures, you can be fooled into thinking that somebody who can do tricks is from God. But nothing, no matter how supernatural it may be, is from God if it is contrary to scripture. In fact, if it is contrary to Scripture, 
then according to the word of God, it is a test from God to see if we will believe the lying wonders and the person who perpetrates it, or we're going to believe the word of God. It is a test. And you better fall on the side of God's word because it is a test. Supernatural things prove one thing. A supernatural thing happened. It doesn't prove that it's from God. In fact, all supernatural things that contradict the word of God, that all supernatural things done by people who are promoting a message that is contrary to Scripture are done by the power of the devil, not God. The word of God is the dividing line. The word of God is the yardstick whereby you know if something is of God or not, supernatural or whatever. Verse 13. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed, beholding the miracles and the signs which were done. Well, you see where Simon's focus was. It was on the miracles. It was on the signs and wonders that Philip was doing, not on the word of God. And it says that Simon believed, and he did believe. He believed the facts about Jesus, evidently, but that didn't make him right with God because just adhering to the facts about Jesus doesn't make anyone right with God. He believed he wasn't right with God. He was caught up in the miracles. He was caught up in the Hollywood aspect of the Jesus movement. Verse 14. Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. So for the sake of church unity, the apostles had to verify that these Samaritans were actually Christians. That is, that they had been accepted by God through faith in Jesus Christ. And we see here, anyway, clearly there was a hierarchy in the church and the apostles were at the top. Verse 15, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans had believed. The Samaritans had been baptized. But in this particular case, God delayed giving them the Holy Spirit until after the apostles arrived. It had to be done that way. Or the apostles who were Jewish probably never would have believed that these non-Jew Samaritans that were so despised by Jews in general could ever possibly be saved or accepted by God. So God delayed the gift of the Holy Spirit. And notice verse 18. And when Simon saw, when Simon saw, that they through the laying of the apostles' hands, the whole, that through the laying of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. What Simon didn't understand is that only the apostles could deliver the Holy Spirit by laying on hands. And what he did not understand is that God's gifts cannot be bought. Verse 19, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. He wanted to add the dispensing of the Holy Ghost on those he touched to his already large bag of tricks. I suppose he figured that if he could get the hang of that trick, he could really increase his influence and popularity because he saw the excitement that the apostles were stirring up as they did miracles, as supernatural things accompanied the preaching of Jesus. 
Verse 20. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. God's gifts cannot be bought. It is wrong to think that we have the means to earn or purchase things from God which are of infinite value. Can't be done. It is insulting to suggest that we can pay God off and obtain forgiveness or anything else that he offers as a gift. 21. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. And there is no salvation for anyone whose heart is not right before God. We all sin, but someone who is saved has a heart for God in spite of the fact that they still fail him. We all sin, but someone who has received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior wants to please God. They have a heart for God. An unsaved person is concerned about himself, like Simon, his popularity, making money, having a crowd, having applause, whatever the case may be, getting the latest materialistic toy. The unsaved are concerned about themselves, not what God may want or not what God may like. Verse 22, repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God that if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. To be forgiven, once again we see, you need to repent. That means be willing to stop whatever sin you are committing, all of them. Repentance means to turn away from sin, all of them. Be willing to repent, to stop committing the sins that you are committing. It means to be sorry for doing them. It means to want to stop doing them. It means to want to stop doing those sins. It means to confess the sins that you have committed. That is, that is an attorney with all your heart to Jesus. That is repentance. It's a complete turnaround from your sin to Jesus, from submitting to your sinful lust to submitting to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. That is repentance. In a nutshell, that's it. Don't let anybody tell you that repentance is a change of mind concerning who Jesus is. I know that's a very modern definition of repentance, but it is extremely unbiblical. I used to not think that Jesus was the Son of God. Now I think he's the Son of God, therefore I have repented. You haven't repented. That's not repentance. Repentance in Scripture from Genesis through Revelation is always connected to sin, to turning to, from sin to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he tells Simon, repent. Therefore, turn away from this wicked sin of thinking that you can buy holy things from God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. You're hooked on your sin, Simon, and you better repent. Which just goes to show that even if you are hooked on a sin, It's a matter of repentance to overcome it. Simon is full of envy. Peter says, he wants to be able to lay hands on others and watch something supernatural happen, just like the apostles did. He's full of envy and he's full of sin. He does evil things and he has ungodly motives for the good things that he wants to do. He is trapped in his sinful nature and he needs to repent of that or he will not be saved. And it doesn't matter that he believes the facts about Jesus. 
He st- after believing the facts about Jesus, after believing the truth, which the Bible said he did, the apostle still said, you need to repent, Simon. 24. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. No mention of repentance by Simon. He wants prayers to be delivered from the consequences of his sin, and that's it. He doesn't say he'll repent. He doesn't say, pray for me, I'm repenting. He says, deliver me from the consequences of my sin. He's like many today. They don't want to stop their sinful behavior, but they want to avoid hell. It's not going to work. It's not going to cut it. Everybody wants to avoid hell unless you're crazy. But most people won't avoid hell because they don't want to quit their sin. They don't want to repent. Turn away from their sin and turn to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. 25. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Peter and John preached Christ everywhere they went. They headed back to Jerusalem, and every step of the way, they preached Jesus on the way back home. And the villages and towns they were in were probably some of the same places that Jesus himself taught in. And now the apostles can give them the complete story about Jesus Christ because he's died on the cross and he's risen from the dead. They can tell him, they can tell these people that the one who taught and did miracles among them died for their sins and rose from the dead, rose from the dead three days later. Verse 26. And an angel of the Lord spoke unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. Philip, now keep this in mind, Philip is seeing big results in Samaria. Remember, he's the one that took the gospel there. He's, he's seeing great things happen. People are turning to Christ. And now God tells him to travel 80 miles to the south, to a desert. Sometimes it is God's will for his people to walk away from something that they are very successful at doing. So look at 27. And he arose and he went. God wants me to do it, I'll do it. Doesn't make sense probably, but I'll do it. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot. He read Isaiah, the prophet. Well, Philip traveled all that way, 80 miles away from something that was very successful, spiritually speaking. He probably didn't know, wondering why. And now it's probably becoming a little more clear to Philip why God had him leave that populated area where things were going so well and go to a deserted place because there was one man there who was reading his Bible. There was one man there who had a heart for the truth. There was one man who God knew would receive the truth about Jesus Christ if he heard it. And this, is, and this is what I say to people who ask what they think 
is a question that has no answer. What about all the heathen who have never heard about Jesus Christ? Will God send them to hell? And I know it's fashionable today by modern evangelicals to say, no, no, as long as they're sincere, they'll go to heaven. No, that's wrong. That's unbiblical. The Bible says there's no other name given among men by which we must be saved, the name of Jesus. Jesus said, unless you believe in me, you will die in your sin. They have to hear about Jesus. They have to respond to Jesus. I heard somebody say the other day, Muslims, atheists, Hindus, all these people will be saved if they're sincere. And this is a popular preacher. Good Lord. Have we gone completely crazy? You can tell when people aren't in the Word of God like they should be. They say such stupid things, and it would be bad enough it was if, you, if you just had to listen to that ridiculous rot. But when immortal souls are at stake, it is a horrible tragedy. And boy, are they accountable to God for saying such foolish, wicked, unbiblical things. But it's becoming clear. There was one man who had a heart for truth, and God knew that if he would hear the truth about Jesus, he would respond. So he says, Philip, I want you to travel 80 miles to get to this guy, which leads me to say this. If there is someone somewhere who honestly hungers for truth and would accept the truth about Jesus Christ if they only heard it, God will get enough truth to that person, enough truth about Jesus Christ to that person. Somehow, some way, he'll get it to them so that they can receive it and be saved. But they're not going to get saved if they don't hear it and receive it. Faith is what saves us. And the Bible says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Salvation isn't a matter of just being sincere no matter what you believe or trying your best. That is such a damnable lie. Faith comes from hearing the Word of God, the Word of God about Jesus. And faith is the thing that saves. So that's why God had Philip go 80 miles into a desert because there was one man there. Verse 29. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. Philip was led by God's Spirit. That's very clear, isn't it? He was led by God's Spirit. Who told Philip to go there? Who told Philip to go 80 miles away from Samaria into a desert, the Holy Spirit? Once he got to that desert, who told Philip to go up to that man riding in his chariot? The Holy Spirit. God does not need some third party to tell you what his will for you is if you are a Christian. If somebody comes up to you and says, thus saith the Lord, God told me that he wants you to do this or that or the other thing, tell them to take a hike. Tell them to go jump in the lake, as my elderly mom used to say. Tell them to shut up and get away from you. Tell them, get behind me, Satan. As Jesus said to Peter, when Peter said a foolish thing that contradicted the word of God. Get behind me, Satan. I'm not listening to you. If you're a Christian, you are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And God doesn't need somebody else to tell you what he wants you to do. The, the Bible says those who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. The Holy Spirit will lead you into what he wants you to do. Your job is to stay, is to stay close to God through Jesus Christ, through the Word of God, through prayer, through confession of sin, and the Holy Spirit will lead you. The Bible says the steps of a righteous person are ordained by a third party, by some would-be prophet who likes to run around and say, God told me. 
God showed me? Well, God showed me you're going to hell if you don't repent. God showed me you're going to hell if you don't quit taking God's name in vain, you false prophet, you Elimus, you Simon the sorcerer, you devil in the flesh. I have no problem telling those people to shut their mouth and get out of me, get away from me. I have no problem in telling them that at all because they are taking God's name in vain, speaking presumptuously for the Lord. Contrary to Scripture, it's not of God. Don't you listen to them. You just get close to Jesus. He'll show you what to do. The Holy Spirit will show you what to do. You can be sure of that. And Philip ran there to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Philip ran. God told him where to go. He ran. Sometimes people can think too much. You know that? Be quick to obey God. Don't try to analyze the outcome before obeying. If we think rather than obey, we may fail to obey. Or it may be too late to obey. 31. And he said, how can I? How can I understand except some man should guide me? And he besought Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Boy, what an open door. Because the Ethiopian didn't have the Holy Spirit, who is the writer of Scripture that he was reading, the Word of God made no sense to him. He still wanted truth, but it made no sense to him. He needed a teacher. Well, enter Philip. 32. The place of the Scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb before his shearers, so opened he not his mouth. Talk, talk, talking about Jesus Christ. That's what that verse is talking about. Talking about the fact that Jesus Christ did not resist his arrest, his betrayal, his suffering on the cross. Why? He did not resist what he knew to be God's will. He did not complain that God's will was too hard for him. And knowing how Jesus was should make us realize that we should not complain or feel sorry for ourselves when things are not good. Just accept it as the will of God. Change it if you can. Pray for change. Change it if you can for the better. But if you can't, it is what it is. Don't complain. Accept it as the will of God. For at least right now, it is. So anyway, 33. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Words fail when trying to describe the evil of the generation that rejected and murdered God's son. Injustice isn't nearly strong enough. Justice was thrown to the ground and trampled. 34. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? And a question, a question like that is a soft pitch right across home plate. If you're a Christian, who wants to serve God. Thank you for that question. And Philip is going to jump all over it and hit it right out of the park. What a great opportunity he has to speak about Jesus. And we'll pick it up next time and see his answer. Join me next time. And uh, until then, please remember to continue studying the Word of God if you are able at thebibleversebyverse.com. Check it out. Study God's Word from Genesis through Revelation using my audio Bible messages at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com. While you are there, please remember that we are brought to you by your prayers and financial support for over 30 years. This has been a faith ministry. I've never been underwritten by a large church or denomination, as you know. Depend on you, people like you who love God's Word. So pray for this ministry, please. Click the donate button at the top of the front page at thebibleversebyverse.com and prayerfully give as the Lord may lead. Until next time, Michael Moret for Scripture Verse by Verse, 
So long, everyone.